Hi guys, I'm Monica, one of the founders for Everlasting Brows and today I'll present to you the bespoke brow patterns. Why are we talking about brow patterns? Well, brow patterns are a very important part of the brow design for your clients. It's not enough for you to design the right shape in the right place with the correct symmetry. It's also important than the actual placement of the hair strokes, if it's hair strokes that you're performing, are in the right place. What does that mean? It means it should be suitable for that particular client. Going with whatever that client has currently, or perhaps if you're working on a client that doesn't have any eyebrows at all, you will still try to find the most suitable design of the hair flow for that particular person. Everyone at the end of the day wants to look beautiful, fresh and younger. So the patterns. For the patterns, let's start with the everlasting classic three types of patterns. What are they and what do we use them for? We have created um, three very easy to distinguish patterns. They are very different from each other and I feel like for most clients you can um, use them and try to still um, make them bespoke for each and every person. For some of your clients, you'll be making slimmer versions of the patterns. For other clients, you'll be making slightly wider, more bushy look. But the patterns are really the basics you need to have in order to create ultra-realistic results each and every time. The first pattern that I would like to present to you, it's called Uplift. Uh, it looks like what's very trendy now, the brow lamination technique. The eyebrows are uplifted, they're going upwards, they're really nice and bushy. It gives you that fuller brow appearance, very modern, very edgy look. Not for everyone, however, for people that perform brow lamination all the time, that brush their eyebrows upwards um, or simply use gel, eyebrow styling gel to, to, to style them that way every day, this will be the pattern that's suitable for them. And also, obviously, for people that have naturally eyebrows growing in that pattern. It's perhaps a smaller percentage of your clients, but still I see on a weekly basis clients with the uplift pattern and it's quite nice and refreshing. And I feel like it's also, it, it should be, it should be the easiest pattern to master. However, often it, uh, it poses some, some, some issues uh, for my students, but I will explain to you how to go ahead and make sure you master the uplift brow perfectly. So with the first pass, you would always try to ensure you mark your shape perfectly. So the way to start with the uplift pattern, just like with any other patterns, would be to ensure you create enough strokes during your first pass to mark the shape. That means if you wipe off your pre-draw, the shape should be quite apparent. It will not be full, it will not be the finished look. However, you need to see the front of the brow, the tail, you need to see enough markings on the bottom line of the brow, enough markings on the top of the brow. And gradually, what I would suggest here, it try to look at the hair strokes and make sure they gradually fall and slightly collapse to the side. This is the best way um, I can explain to you. So going from um, quite an upward facing stroke, gradually with each and every pass, you make the strokes fall gently and curve onto the side. 
So when doing the uplift, I suggest to you that you should try and perform each and every pass with fluffy strokes. Some connected strokes or strokes that are parallel to each other. Um, so try to break down the stroke that you would normally um, imagine making from the bottom line to the top line of the brow, ensuring it's not one continuous line. It doesn't look good. It's actually very hard to maintain the same pressure within that stroke. So breaking that down into two or three strokes, it's a way better and way more natural of achieving beautiful, realistic looking strokes. So this is my suggestion for your skeleton stroke for the uplift pattern. In the secondary pattern of the, in the secondary pass of the uplift pattern, I would suggest basically working to fill in the brow, create more density, make them appear fuller, um, recreate the lost hairs um, on your client brows. But when you look at what you did during the first pass, try to do a similar thing. However, where you make the connecting strokes or where you see that point where your bottom stroke finishes and your top one starts, try to ensure that point, that breaking point, it's in a different level from your first pass. It will give additional dimension and a more natural flow to the brow. Sometimes I see people try and perform this pattern and each and every line of strokes is identical and that doesn't look very realistic. So that is my second tip, how to create it in a better way to make sure they look fluffy, they look natural and they look quite realistic. Okay, so the final pass for the uplift would consist of filling in even more if necessary to build extra density. So here you can work with quite creative, short strokes, extra strokes at the top of the brow, at the bottom of the brow, somewhere in the middle, really trying to fill all the gaps, make sure there are no see-through spaces, that the eyebrow doesn't look like has any holes in there. So be quite creative. You can work with a shorter needle in here um, making sure you really work in the areas that will enhance the brow the most. And it's usually the last passes that can be quite different on the left brow and the right brow. Here you need to have a look at both of the brows, what they look like after already the two passes and figure out, compare, see if perhaps one eyebrow really needs more of your work than the other one. So don't try and work continuously and do exactly the same three strokes here, three strokes there, two strokes here and two strokes there because that might not be what the client needs. What you're trying to do for each and every client is build more harmony and give them more balanced look. That means sometimes that one brow will need that extra bit of help um, from you as an artist. The next pattern that we have, and it's quite the opposite of the uplift, it has quite a lot of downward facing strokes. We call it the Asian pattern. It doesn't mean that only Asian clients will have that kind of pattern. I personally have Asian pattern myself. Asian pattern can be tricky to master when you don't know how to work on the second part of the brow. So all the eyebrows will mostly start in the same way. You have few hair strokes that go upwards and then you have to kind of follow but very rapidly with exactly the same thing that you did for the uplift brow. You have few strokes going upwards and very quickly the bottom line of the brow collapses to the side and then you no longer have space for any upward facing strokes. 
then what you do at the top line of the brow, you're creating what we call the bridge or the rainbow. This is a series of some slightly rounded looking strokes that will create that semicircle form that we call the transition point. So essentially what that does, you have one stroke going upwards, another one a little bit more sideways, another one even more, and eventually they break and start curving downwards. And from that point, only strokes can go downwards. Different pattern, also just as beautiful, can look nice and fluffy. Don't forget to curve the strokes. This is also something that um, I often see and I feel like that's what helps your pattern look more natural when there's always a little bit of a curve to each and every stroke. You can also have connecting strokes. You can have a combination of longer and shorter strokes. So make sure um, you have the, um, the main strokes, the shorter strokes, some connecting strokes. And yes, the, the top line here, it's the one that's quite defining for the shape in your first skeleton pass. It's after the top line when you starting to work on already the tail part, you need to create quite a bit of density there to make sure you mark the whole eyebrow from top to bottom. So as you can see from the skeleton strokes, this eyebrow is fuller. It's fuller looking after the first pass. It has just a little area that looks quite empty. The rest of the brow, especially the tail, it's quite filled in. And you have to do it that way, not to lose the shape once you wipe off your pigment after the first pass. The secondary pass for the um, Asian brows also consists of exactly doing what we did before, building more density, hiding any gaps, intensifying the tail, building more layers and trying to slowly work on filling in the empty space after the initial first pass. And what's going to happen with the first, third, third pass uh, for the Asian brows? You will create even more density trying to work continuously on bringing some strokes higher and more across in that empty space. Um, you can try and make them longer, making sure you don't have too many short strokes. Bear in mind that strokes always here shorter than what you do on day one of the procedure. So if you're aiming to create only short strokes, you might not have enough density actually. So a combination of long and short is always good. And as you can see, nicely filled eyebrow um, works really well here. The tip for the Asian brows is to always try and define the bottom part of the tail. I feel like this area, it's always forgotten. Sometimes it looks just too empty. It looks like hairs are still missing. So although you kind of created some kind of a shape, it feels like there isn't enough density. So as you can see in the final passes, I added some really tiny baby strokes just to ensure the bottom line of that tail of the Asian brow, it's fuller looking, creates more definition and that the shape looks more pronounced and visible for that client. Also, you often, often notice that clients that have that particular pattern naturally, they actually don't have very good density of the hairs at the tail. So this is your job. I would urge you to try and practice and make sure that the tails are really nice and full, um, super fluffy, that there is a good density there. However, beware of cutting the strokes into each other. They can connect, but they shouldn't cross. European pattern is probably one of the favorites 
for everlasting. I know a lot of students just fall in love with that pattern and they try to perform it on each and every client. And yet the starting students have a very difficult time trying to master this pattern. And why is it so? Um, because the European pattern really combines the two previous ones. The European pattern combines the uplift and the Asian. When you look at this brow, and if you were to divide this brow into two skinnier brows, so if you were to draw a line in the middle of the brow, really across it to, 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 to divide it into two slimmer sisters, uh, if you have a look at the first pass, you will notice that the lower part of that brow, the mini brow, would be the uplifted brow, and the upper part of that brow would be the Asian. Yeah, so we're creating both the uplift and the Asian, and the way we combine them together, we combine them together, and that pattern is suddenly called European. Quite a lot of people will naturally have that pattern, you can also create that pattern for clients that maybe have um, an uplift pattern but very slim eyebrows and um, over tweezed eyebrows and you feel like you actually need to build the top of the brow for your clients. If the top of the brow is missing, you can of course build the top to be downward facing like the Asian pattern and turn what they have into the European. You can of course try and turn an Asian pattern into European if after the brow mapping you, reali you realize that quite a big chunk of the lower part of the brow is actually missing. Therefore you could try and build it up with the upward facing stroke and make it into the European pattern. However, if someone has super big and bushy and full brows that completely don't look like this pattern, you shouldn't use it. So, nevertheless, just like with any other pattern, the first pass ensures we mark the front of the brow, the tail, the arch, enough strokes at the bottom line and enough strokes at the top line. And what I suggest to do here, try to make sure that your strokes, the ones that are marking the bottom line and the top line, are not very intensely going upwards or downwards. They should be really going gently up and to the side and gently down and to the side. It's always better if they are kind of facing the tip of each stroke, facing towards the tail you will find it way easier to create more layers in your secondary and, 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 and third and fourth and any more passes that you might want to do. So with the secondary pass for the European, you'll do a little bit of what you already did before. You'll fill the front just to create a little bit more density Again, with pairs of different strokes, two strokes here, three strokes there. You can um, also add some secondary short strokes if you feel they are needed. But the way we will try to build density in that empty area of the brow, which is the middle of the brow, we'll be usually doing it with single strokes. So you'll try and find a stroke from the previous pass that has a free edge available. What does that mean? It means that there is enough of a space for you next to that stroke to make one stroke below it, bring it up to meet with the previous stroke and almost create like an extension, again facing towards the tail of the brow. Here, the key to your success and the key to really beautifully uh, artistic looking eyebrows, it's exactly that, trying to create layers and layers of these connecting strokes. What will that do in the end for you? It will create eyebrows that look nice, realistic, fluffy and hairy on the outside and inside of the brow there will be really quite a lot of density creating that um, more edgy, more intense look. 
Also bear in mind that actually clients that naturally have that pattern, you will notice more density and more darkness in actual the middle part of the brow. So this pattern mimics what happens naturally perfectly well. Again, each and every continuous pass for the European pattern will do exactly the same thing. Really, just as much as you can, try and find the previous strokes with the free edge available. Go below that stroke, make an extension, connect with the previous stroke a little bit and make a longer stroke, again facing and going towards the tail. The more layers you can fit in there, the better. It will create more density, it will create better attention, but obviously you will be limited here by the width of the brow. So depending how thick is the design of your brow. Sometimes you might have six, seven, eight layers of the secondary strokes, but sometimes you might have only four or five. Okay, and now for those of you that are already familiar with the classic patterns or perhaps wanting to try something a little bit more challenging, I have for you the wild wet brows. Not wild west, wild and wet. Why? Because I feel like this particular pattern really mimics the way your eyebrows look when you come out of the shower. When they are wet and kind of clumping together, there's quite a lot of water retention in the, in the um, eyebrows and they look quite nice. In order to achieve that look, you will be creating quite a lot of connecting strokes. However, they will be different than the ones before. So before you were creating connecting strokes, whereas one has always the tip somewhere else from, from the previous one. So if one tip ended here, the other one would come to connect with that particular stroke and create an extension. Whereas here, they'll be coming nicely together like almost little claws. Here, so you can see with the wild wet brows, we can have even hair strokes facing the other way to make them a little bit more messy. That wet look when you come out of the shower, your eyebrows are not always the best version of themselves. They are behaving a little wild, but it looks really natural actually. So. Let me break it down for you and show you how I perform this eyebrow step by step. So the skeleton strokes here are also shown for you um, in the version of a European pattern, but you can try and perform this with any other pattern as well. I usually try to do um, this pattern in the European version or I also feel it suits a lot of clients with the uplifted brows. Um, with the Asian brows not so much unless you do only really few wet wild strokes at the, um, at the front of the brow. So let's have a look here. I really have lots of skeleton strokes that are really coming together to create the tiny little claws. This is best achieved with a small blade. Um, smaller blade, I know a lot of you like to use a U blade, but I actually find that I can be more precise and guide my blade better to create the really um, nice sharp edges for this particular pattern with a tiny blade, like a seven. I like to use 7.18, I feel like I have a perfect control with it and that's what I will do. Yes, I have some shorter strokes here and um, even, if they, even if they shorten, even if they shrink once they heal, you will still have 
the, 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 the flow from the first strokes because now you're connecting all of them. So everything else is pretty much similar. Like the first pattern, you also notice here I created some hair strokes flicking upwards a little bit, like the reverse strokes. This is not necessary for that look, but also adds to that wild, wet look. What are we doing with the secondary pass? The secondary pass, it's different from the previous version of, of um, European pattern. You'll notice here that I'm creating quite a lot of hugging strokes. So I already have my initial claw and now I'm creating the hugging strokes from both sides if possible. So really I'm trying to encapsulate what I already created by closing it in from both sides with new strokes. And again, if possible, these new strokes that are coming in to, to grab the previous strokes are again joining together nicely. If possible, of course, not everywhere you might have the space, you might not want to do it on every single previous stroke, but try to do it as much as possible. This creates that wet look, it creates the look of hairs that gather together because there's a lot of water there, and it makes it look, it creates a different texture to the brow. With each additional pass, I will try to again enclose my previous strokes in a new pair of strokes that try as much as possible to hug each other and meet at the same spot. You can, of course, right now have more strokes that go a little bit more across and are not really connected with anything else because we are still trying to work very nicely to fill the middle of the brow, ensuring that there's no gaps, ensuring that there's no, no funny areas where you feel like you are limited and suddenly there's no way for you to connect it with anything else. So take your time when you make the decision, especially if you're performing it for the first few times, but be, uh, be careful, but also be adventurous. It really creates a wonderful finished result. With the yet additional pass, if you can, try to add. You can do it with the same color. Sometimes you can try uh, and, and pick up a different color for it if you want. And try and create really as much density as possible at the front of the brow, even with very short once connecting strokes and of course try and again encapsulate as many of the previous strokes as you manage and create in other areas some shorter uh, strokes that fill in the gaps fill in the tail um, perhaps connect to something else or simply create extensions to some other strokes that perhaps you were finding could be um, quite too short. So the middle of the brow looks quite clean, it looks quite smooth, but it's the edges that suddenly look more spiky, uh, more edgy, it's slightly more almost um, aggressive look just because there is that different texture appearance. And additionally with this pattern um, to create even more of that of that extra wet, extra soaked hair look, you can add a little bit of shading to the groups of the hairs you were creating. Um, it's not necessary. This looks absolutely enough. But if anyone wanted a little bit more intense look, you can go ahead and add the shading here and there sporadically. It's a very beautiful result. And finally, a little bit about um, strokes performed with the device. So, of course, 
you should be able to perform most of the strokes that you perform with microblading if you have a good device and if you are skilled permanent makeup artist. However, most of the time I will not choose to, to perform my strokes with a device because it's simply easier with a microblade. I feel like microblades are the perfect way to do hair strokes. It's a tiny little tool that, that helps you really place it where you need it. There is no vibration, the tool is ultra light, you have the perfect control to create super defined, super smooth and extra sharp hair strokes. There's absolutely no need to have to perform it with the device. So if I want to create really fluffy, really full look with lots of tiny little hair strokes connecting here and there, I will definitely choose my micro blade and my very precise sharp blades. However, if you want to create a little bit more of a flowy look or a look where there's uh, lots of long hair strokes or if you simply are working with machine um, currently doing maybe just ombre and you're not trained when it comes to microblading the way to try hair strokes with machine the way I suggest to you is try the long flowy strokes that connect in the middle and the way to work on them is to start the eyebrow from the tail this shouldn't be uh, big news for people that already do ombre. Most likely you're already starting to work from there. So I would suggest working also in pairs of strokes, trying to create one stroke and kind of stemming each and every new stroke out of the previous one. I think you can see a little bit of that here um, on my graphics. But let me show you the next one. This would normally be your, your first pass with your machine. You can work with your one pointer needle and really glide the device to create some smooth and longish looking hair strokes that taper at the end. You work with some of them upwards, some of them downwards and create a fluffy enough look. You mark the shape nicely, it's still very airy. It's a different look from microblading. With microblading, usually we try to create more density, really more of a solid shape. Whereas here, I feel like we can often make the shape really big, but still ensure it's, it's lighter, it's softer, it's not as obvious. It's a good look for someone who is maybe also scared of permanent makeup and um, doesn't want too much to start with. It can be performed beautifully. After the um, first pass, you can go with um, a light color or the same color, just work faster with faster hand movement to create less defined strokes like I did here on my example, less defined strokes here and there, less pigmentation, they will heal softer, they will almost look like they disappearing, they kind of just will be creating additional texture there. And if I'm working with the device and I already have my device out and I feel like it would be a shame to just finish the procedure where it is, I have a very nice precise cartridge so to make this particular hair pattern look more fluffy give it a little bit of dimension I will also go wherever I find it suitable for my client whenever the hair strokes are connecting because remember each hair stroke well in the main body of the brow stems from another Try to find some locations where when the stroke's connecting, you kind of shade that little triangle there. Shade it more intensely in that meeting point of the strokes and bring the shading out and, and, and make it eventually disappear. It doesn't take long. It's not a huge effort with a one-pointer needle 
and it really adds quite a nice texture. I feel like it helps the eyebrows to become more alive um, for a lot of clients that also don't have hair. They want to maintain that hair look. They are scared of uh, an eyebrow pattern that's maybe too dense for them and they don't need too much shading. Uh, a lot of shading will actually distract from, from the hair strokes, will almost even blur them, but adding a little bit of here and there, really precise shading in the areas chosen by you, strategic areas, can make it look really um, super nice. Also, one more thing to mention. Yes, I presented to you quite a few different patterns, so I'm pretty sure you'll be busy practicing to master all of them. But I wanted point, to point out a few things. Sometimes um, the pattern is unsuitable for the client just because you didn't do your prep work right. What does that mean? I understand that there's often situations where you find it hard to figure out where the eyebrows should be. How to find the balance and where to incorporate your new pattern. You often hesitate and tend to not know where to go and how to deal with maybe too much hair or too much fuzzy hair growth around the eyebrows. There's often this dilemma between what hair has to stay and what hair should go. Yeah, so I feel um, like this is the reason why sometimes you're trying to maybe incorporate too much hair into the pattern or the wrong, the hairs that are sitting in the wrong um, place. Uh, into the pattern and that's why then it's perhaps not the, 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 the suitable look for the client. So I have one suggestion for you. Please don't forget brow mapping. Brow mapping literally saves your clients lives. It gives them beautiful eyebrows, ensures you are always ready to perform to the best of your ability and the eyebrows that really work for the client's face. It's not only in the beautiful patterns, it also has to be the right shape for your clients. So don't forget about brow mapping, learn brow mapping if you're not familiar with it yet. I highly recommend it. And on that note, happy practicing. Thank you, that's all from me today.